But there's something about Van Gogh's legacy which is much more important than his fathering this or that ism of modern art. Vincent's passionate belief was that people wouldn't just see his pictures, but feel the rush of life in them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Today is the 19th of March and the 130th anniversary of the letter that Theo van Gogh wrote to his brother Vincent. And this was 10 days or 11 days before Vincent's 37th birthday, which was on the 30th of March and which happened basically four months, four short months before his death in uh, July, at the end of July. Now, for those who are thinking about the coronavirus and worrying about it, um, the Vincent van Gogh story kind of provides an analogy to that because he was also suffering from a kind of a unknown affliction and even 130 years later, we're still not sure exactly what it was. The true crime rocket science theory is that he had advanced syphilis, but that he was kind of having remissions so in other words there were periods where he overcame the illness and he got better and then there were periods where he sort of indulged and exerted himself and didn't rest and all that kind of thing and we're going to see in the response from Theo so the response from Theo is from a, a letter after a long silence from Vincent um, he wrote a letter on the 15th and then Theo responded on the 19th and we're going to get a, a little bit of insight into what Theo thought of Vincent's condition and you know what that tells us the other thing to bear in mind is you know we're in a period right now of you know a fear of of, of infection a fear of of illness, uh, um, a situation of being isolated, a situation of being um, being prevented from doing what you want to do, prevented from working, prevented from socializing. <clears throat> and in a strange way through Van Gogh we kind of get a sense of what that feels like after a year. Bear in mind he'd been in the asylum for a year and he'd, he'd kind of volunteered, he'd kind of um, uh, admitted himself to the asylum but after a year he was starting to feel that he wanted to, to let himself out but he kind of needed permission, he kind of needed his brother to approve this and he, he needed his doctors to do the same. It wasn't really a case that he was forced to stay there, it was kind of a negotiated situation. It was kind of for the good of Van Gogh and the good of society that he needed to stay in the asylum. And a lot of people are wrestling with those same ideas is, well, is this really so good for me, you know, that I can't go to the beach, that I can't go to gym, that I can't, you know, go and see someone that I know isn't ill. And so you kind of have a similar situation here where it's someone else telling you well it's for your own good and you know for a while that's okay but it, it soon gets um, as it gets a little bit old and bear in mind all of this is happening in kind of real time I mean that's why I'm doing this the way I'm doing it um, the 19th of March is like the first day of spring in the northern hemisphere so there are signs of that taking place there are flowers blooming, buds blossoming, shoots being revealed, green shoots on trees and, and all that kind of thing. And, you know, recently I saw a interview, I think on Sky, I think it was Sky News, and it showed a family who were being quarantined or isolated and you had the father upstairs and the, and the mother and the children downstairs talking to a camera through the window but right to the uh, on the right hand side of the frame in terms of the 
the viewpoint of the camera was this I'm not sure what tree it was but it was in full blossom it was these bright pink blossoms that were sort of entering the frame and in other um, footage I've, I've seen white blossoms as well so this is starting to happen right now kind of in the northern hemisphere and this awakening of nature is kind of also spurring on Vincent himself to, to say well you know it's been a long winter I want to kind of get out I, I may not be completely healthy but I want to I don't want to stay here anymore isn't there somewhere else I can go to can't I go to the countryside and I think that's what a lot of people right now are thinking as well. Do I have to stay cooped up in this apartment or in this in this suburb or in the city? Couldn't I go to some country place and you know f have a feeling of freedom, even though one's freedom is less, right? Okay, so let's go to the letter from. Theo van Gogh, Vincent's younger brother, written from Paris on the 19th of March, 1890. And as I said, a response to that letter of the 15th. My dear Vincent, we were really pleased to receive your last letter, but we're sorry from the bottom of our hearts that you can't give us better news. You'll need an enormous amount of patience to overcome the trouble your condition must cause you. However, there's a tendency to improvement, which we must begin by being extremely glad about. The cold weather always has an influence on you, and it's possible that milder weather will cure you entirely. Let's hope so, and don't tire yourself out too much. How pleased I would have been if you'd been there at the Independence Exhibition. It was the day of the private viewing when Carnot came. I was there with Joe. Your paintings are well placed and look very well. Many people came up to ask me to give you their compliments. Gorga said that your paintings are the key to the exhibition. He suggests an exchange of one of his canvases for the one of the Alpils. I told him that I didn't think you'd have any objection, on the contrary that it would please you that he likes your painting. I also like it very much, that painting, and it looks admirably admirably well in the exhibition. Surga exhibited a most curious painting there, searching to express things through the direction of the line. Certainly expresses movement, but it has a most curious appearance and not very generous as regards ideas. Goulamin is exhibiting several things, some very good ones among them. De Lautrec has an excellent portrait of a woman at the piano and a large painting which holds its own very well. There's a great distinction in it, despite the risque subject. In general, it's noticeable that the public is beginning to be more and more interested in the young Impressionists. There are at least a certain number of art lovers who are beginning to buy them. The Pissarro exhibition is over. Lots of people came and five were sold. For the moment, that's all we were hoping for. Next Sunday, Bernard and Aurier are to come and see your latest canvases. Bernard has been a bit ill, but is feeling better. Enclosed with this, you'll find a letter from Aurier. He's to come shortly to see the Gorgars and do an article on him. I've received the money for your painting from Brussels, and Maus writes to me, When you have an opportunity, please tell your brother that I was very happy that he participated in the Salon of Les Grint, where in the melee of discussions he found lively artistic sympathies. Do you want me to send you the money? I'm holding it for you for whenever you want it. I hope, my dear brother, that you can soon give us more satisfactory news of your health. You'd feel happier if you saw your little godson. Try to find out from Dr. Peyron if he sees no danger in your coming to Paris, when you've recovered from this crisis. Joe sends you her warm regards and joins me joins with me in sending best wishes for your speedy recovery. Good handshake, Theo. So there's quite a lot to talk about in this letter. I want to start with the the end, the sort of greeting. 
which sort of comes at the end of quite a long, almost like business-like discussion, talking business, basically talking about art, exhibitions, artists, and paintings. We'll get to that in a second. So this aspect, the sign-off from Theo, had to have been a source of great hope and cheer uh, and kind of encouragement to Vincent. So here he is, he's just had kind of a crisis bear in mind the crisis came about when he first started thinking about leaving the asylum and Vincent since kind of recovered and now he's talking about leaving again and what his brother is saying to him is look first of all be patient get well but second of all you know maybe you should come here and things are kind of going well you know I've got some money for you do you want me to send it to you or do you need, you know, you can come get it from me directly? And he kind of extends his brother a sort of invitation. He basically says, you'd feel happier if you, if you saw your little godson. In other words, if he saw baby Vincent, Theo's uh, infant child. And you can kind of imagine that in a situation like that, Vincent is going to kind of, in a way, is going to forget his troubles and we kind of caught up in the family dynamic of his brother. You know, this this new um, person that has come into the world, and all that that all the optimism and hope and um, you know impressions of the future that 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 spells. And so, almost as an uncle, Vincent might be sort of inclined to think differently about. First of all, being a bachelor. Second of all, being uh, living the way that he's sort of living. He might start to be thinking of settling down. He might starting to be thinking of, well, am I going to have a child? Should I have a child? Um, I need to take care of myself as well or something like that. But basically, he needs to make himself more acceptable to society, including his brother's family. And that's kind of the challenge. But he's also being challenged you know, he's older than his brother, you know, why don't you have a family yourself? What are you making of your life? Are you a eligible bachelor? And th that is the flip side to that coin. So he is saying, you know, speak to your doctor and find out if there's any danger to you coming to Paris when you've recovered. So this is kind of an invitation from uh, Theo kind of for the first time saying look uh, first of all be patient with what's going on but maybe you should kind of make a trip to Paris now bear in mind he's just made a trip to all and he's kind of had a um, he's had a, a kind of a series of attacks he's had like a really bad um, uh, spell of poor health right so if Theo thought that um, that was a serious problem. I don't think he would have invited him to Paris. And so Theo's diagnosis or Theo's understanding of what was going on with his brother was that his brother had some kind of underlying condition which predated what was going on at the asylum. Do you agree? Because he talks, right in the beginning, he talks about the impact of cold weather on it. Right? He says, the cold weather always has an influence on you. So it's possible that mildy, milder weather will cure you entirely. Let's hope so. And then he also says, don't tire yourself out too much. So his brother's basically saying, you know what? Um, you, you might improve as the weather improves. And also, um, don't, don't tire yourself out too much. Sort of allow yourself to rest. Now, if you think about that kind of diagnosis, it's not really talking much about um, mental health. It's not saying anything other than kind of be patient. It's not saying, um, you know, are you anxious or, you know, get rid of these delusions or um, be careful with your thinking or what medication are you on. It's kind of really just saying two things. Be patient, get enough rest, and let's wait for the weather to be warmer. He's not really talking at all about being concerned about his brother's mental health, right? He's basically saying, you know, I think when it gets warmer, then it, that might be a good time for you to to come and see us, come and see your godson. 
And bear in mind, Vincent himself has already said, you know, I want to. I think I need to go and stay in the countryside. And I think his brother is thinking about that as well. But where? Which countryside? Who's going to look after him? And so that then takes us to the exhibition, and and the exhibition sort of formed the bulk of this letter. And that is, a, I think, another thing just to bear in mind is if. Theo felt that his brother was mad or troubled or so compromised that he couldn't deal with sort of normal commerce. He certainly wouldn't be discussing things like exhibitions, artists and artworks with him. In other words, he, he feels that his brother is so, um, so not level-headed but is uh, is well enough to have a proper conversation. In other words, his cognitive processes are completely fine enough that you can kind of talk about exhibitions and artists and and all that kind of thing in in quite a lot of detail. And in I think he also knows that Vincent's going to be enthused and inspired and encouraged by this. You know, what are other artists achieving? What are other artists doing? What are happening in other exhibitions? What are other artists saying about him? And all of it is kind of encouraging. And one can imagine that Vincent isn't feeling like a nobody, um, certainly not in the art world. He, he's sort of feeling somewhat encouraged that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, that that the, the tide may be about to turn in terms of his work. You'll also notice there are sort of references to Gaga. Gaga seems to be constantly in the in the fabric of stuff. You, you kind of get the sense that the Van Gogh brothers and Gaga have kind of, kind of got a strong bond. They birds of a feather in a way. They have the same attitude to art in some ways, in general ways, but also to um, I don't know, just a broader sense in a way of society and maybe they often drank together and and womanized together when they when they lived in paris i don't know but the there was certainly kind of the a, a fundamental friendship that glued these three men together and and that went beyond art i would say um bear in mind of course that vincent van gogh and his brother were both art dealers. Uh, Vincent van Gogh had, had had worked as an art dealer but then retired and become an artist whereas his brother had become an art dealer and, and was still an art dealer. So there was a certain um, practicality to maintaining certain relationships with certain people including in this case one's brother. So, yeah, and so in, in this case, uh, Theo is saying to his brother, you know, I've got some money for you from that picture you sold. Uh, you know, wh what do you want me to do with it? And then he talks about other artists. Now, Sora, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name, but I think it's Georges Sora, something like that. Um, he was kind of the talk of the town at the time um, in Paris. He... Um, his paintings were widely discussed and all that kind of thing, but but they were also being very much criticised by the movement that came after the Impressionists. That, you know that that it was dull, and, and so you get that same criticism coming from Theo saying um, there's some interesting things about the lines in this painting, but and he expresses movement, but it's um it's not very gener it's not very creative in terms of ideas now what's interesting about that particular painting that theo is talking about um i don't find it a particularly good painting i find it very dull in terms of the color scheme but what is quite interesting in terms of the the painting itself and the theme of it is it's sort of referring to the the can can dance so um the name of the painting kind of means the can can dance now the can can dance sort of came about i think in the early around about the 1830s or so and it caused a scandal at the time i mean at the time it was 
very overtly sexual and I think everybody knows what we're talking about the high kicks of the woman you would sort of have them wearing very um, uh, sort of frilly undergarments and then the high kicks would sort of um, allow the viewer to see quite far into <laughs> A, a, a woman's upraised legs but probably not see uh, anything you're not supposed to see but the point is at this time like um, you know uh, almost almost uh, 200 years ago but you know, so, so maybe 190 years ago uh, 1830 it was basically um, it, was, it was scandalous that kind of thing but it was also extremely popular and it, I mean, it uh, stood the test of time. People are still doing it. It's still something that is kind of popularly done in some theatricals and so on. And so pretty much 60 years after the fact, uh, Serhat was um, depicting this as a kind of iconic aspect to Paris at the time. I don't really want to talk about Serrat's work, you know, I, I more want to talk about uh, Van Gogh and Gauguin, but let's just briefly just um, mention that uh, the art historian John Rewald spoke about the illusion of, um, high -spirited, of a high-spirited ambiance of dance and music, and he refers to the caricatural figures treated stiffly and imposingly but with humor and gaiety so by reducing these people to caricatures and making them almost stiff it kind of gave a strange sense of humor and gaiety if that makes sense so it's almost the the contrast of using lines to stiffen up um, a um, painting of movement that is getting you to think about it in a different way. And so anyway, this particular painting got a lot of people talking and, um, you know, while some people really uh, liked it and, and so on, there were others that said, well, this is really not where we want art to be going. And if you think about, um, if you think about Van Gogh's work, it's the opposite of stiff. It's very fluid, very electric, very lively, and kind of out of focus. It's 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 a it's a kind of a caricature, but that's out of focus. And you you can't really imagine um, Van Gogh really painting. Not that he never did it. I mean, I think he did paint something in a um, arena a Roman, um, what do you call it, a Colosseum. So he has painted crowds together, but not to the extent that Sohat did it. Um, Van Gogh was far more in the countryside and looking at nature, where Sohat was far more preoccupied, I think, with looking at conventions and society and groups of people together, for example, in parks and, uh, you know, um, theatres and things like that. I'm not going to talk about De Lautrec. Um, you can look at the, um, you know, woman at the piano on your own time if you like. What I'm going to talk a little bit about is the Pissarro exhibition, uh, one particular painting. And it's just basically, Pissarro was basically based around Ove. And he, I think he, I'm speaking under correction, but I think it he he basically recommended ultimately to Theo that there was a doctor in Ove that treated people for depression and that he knew artists very well. So that that is kind of the link between um, Theo Vincent, Doctor Gachet, Doctor Paul Gachet, and Ove is this artist Pissarro. Um, I could be wrong, it, it might be another artist, but it was basically on the recommendation of a particular artist. One thing that I know for sure is that Pissarro did paint paintings in and around Ove, and that is where um, Vincent ended up. Bear in mind, the situation is now that 
Vincent wants to leave the asylum. His brother is sort of cautiously open to the possibility of it, but is is sort of um, not is not really sure what the answer is. And the answer would ultimately be well that that you go and stay in Ove, which is so that's Ove Suwa. It's a river on the um, river Was, spelled O I S E. And um, then there he would be much closer to his brother and his family, but that that he'd also be kind of a little bit of a distance away, so that he he wouldn't be like a constant pain in the neck, um, which Van Gogh could be, and that's kind of s- something that might seem insensitive to say that Van Gogh could be a pain in the neck, but he was a pain in the neck to Gauguin or vice versa. But the whole thing is. Theo, I think, wanted Vincent nearer to him, but but not n- too near, not next door. That makes sense. And one way that you're going to test this whole idea is when Vincent is living just like an hour away by train. How often does his brother go and visit him? I mean, he's just around the corner from him. Um, I've I've taken the train from Paris to Auvers and and back, and it's really not far to go to certainly from Ove the train station is sort of you know it runs the, the length of the town um, not not the train station but the, the railway track and you're constantly reminded of the train because the train's coming through there all the time and every tra- time a train does go through the town because of the lay of the land because of the sort of ridge line the train echoes right through that valley and, and um, it's quite um, it almost sounds like an approaching storm. Um, when I stayed there, I stayed on, on in a towering house, like quite a tall three-story house, I believe, on pretty high up on the ridge. And when when this train came through, you could see it from a distance, you could hear it from a distance. And uh, Vincent actually painted that scene as well, which which I'll show to you in due course. Of course, where we are now, none of that is in play yet. The idea has simply just been um, floated. You know, I want to leave here. Um, there's money for you in Paris. There's maybe opportunity for you. And maybe you should think about doing it. Now, what I want to remind you of is Vincent van Gogh it has some kind of affliction. So it's almost like he has the coronavirus, but he's been in self-isolation for a year already. And now he's like, well... You know, I'm, I haven't been feeling that great, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of done here. I'm, I'm done self-isolating, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave. And his brother's like, well, I think you should, but I'm not quite sure what to do with you, right? It's not quite the same as uh, coronavirus. It's not quite the same as the flu, because something like syphilis is something that can. Um, it's it's a bacterial infection that can be quite um, it can consume the human body so it's not something that comes and goes it, it's almost like cancer but it it can really sort of eat away at the body if it's not treated properly and of course you know the true nightmare you know can you imagine having coronavirus in 1890 and people give you something poisonous like digitalis and hot and cold baths to treat you with. If anything, you're going to die even sooner. Right? So some people can have coronavirus and develop sweats and so on, and they may not cough that much. And someone might say, well, you know, maybe you've got some kind of um, epilepsy or something like that. I'm just saying, imagine the nightmare of treating something like this with the medical know-how of 1890 right and i'm just also comparing the situation of isolation and trying to recover and then eventually saying well look i've had enough of it i've been here for so long um i'm not you know uh, if we're gonna be clear vincent wasn't actually better i mean he just had a crisis he just had a set of attacks and his brother didn't say, no, 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 I think, well, you should really stay put where you are. You shouldn't go anywhere. He kind of says, you know what, the weather's getting warmer. I think you should come up to Paris. So his brother understands what's going on with him. 
And his brother doesn't think he's mad. His brother doesn't think he has mental illness. His brother doesn't think he, he has, I don't know, whatever most people do think he has. His brother seems to understand that this is something that can kind of come and go and what, how you need to treat it is with rest. And by the way, how do you treat syphilis? How do you treat syphilis? In its early stages, it's actually quite easy to treat. Just use antibiotics. Of course, in 1890, they didn't have antibiotics. And interestingly, the, the word antibiotic kind of came about as an effective treatment for syphilis. And that happened around about 1909, which is, you know, 19 years after uh, Van Gogh's death. So you can imagine if you have any kind of infection, but you don't have the luxury of using antibiotics, and the same applies to something like coronavirus. If you are um, going to be exposed to a virus, or you have been exposed to a virus and there's no cure, there's no vaccine, then how should you deal with it? A and let's say you do get infected. Well, the, the answer is, well, you need to um, kind of well isolate yourself, you need to rest, you need to take in fluids, but you certainly can't carry on as normal. You can't um, exert yourself as normal, you'll get yourself into trouble. You can't go out in public, you can't go out drinking. I'm talking about when you are actually ill, you will make the illness worse, right? That is how illnesses work. Anything that is going to compromise your immunity, such as fatigue, not getting enough sleep, you know, not eating properly, that is going to make you more vulnerable to any kind of illness. Absent proper, you know, modern medical care. So I'm not going to take it further than that. I hope you found this episode uh, interesting. The next episode will be tomorrow, which is where... Paul Gauguin writes to Van Gogh, and that happened on March the 20th. And that just shows you, the, again, the connection between these two artists, despite the ear incident, that, that uh, they, they maintain some kind of civil relationship. And think about it in both ways. If Van Gogh cut his own ear off because his friend left him, but they still write to each other and they're still friends, that's one way of looking at it. The other one is that Gauga cut off Vincent's ear. But maybe Vincent was acting badly or something like that. I don't know. Or maybe they were fighting over a woman. But that's also another way to think about it, is which one is more likely. And certainly you could make the argument that if Gauga cut off Vincent's ear, he wouldn't stay friends with this guy. Right? The interesting thing is, although they maintain civil relations, so Gauguin writes an occasional letter to Vincent, they never really see each other again. They never saw each other again after the year incident, and Gauguin never came to um, Vincent's funeral, even though he was sort of in the area. So that's something to bear in mind as well. So I am going to be continuing the analysis that I spoke about earlier about the accidental death i'll uh, come back to that particular topic but for tomorrow it'll be uh, paul gogar uh, those who are interested in the tcrs theory of uh, van gogh basically the ear incident these medical um, a medical assessment and also his you know what ultimately happened to him you can, uh, you can read The Murder of Vincent van Gogh. It's available on Kindle. I strongly advise you not to buy the paperback version at the moment. The print's quite small. And the Kindle version's got a lot of wonderful links to news articles, to, to paintings, you know, images of paintings, to uh, documentaries and all sorts of other things. Um, so if you're interested in the ongoing coverage of the... Uh, saga of Vincent van Gogh, please subscribe to this channel. If you head on over to the Patreon channel of True Crime Rocket Science, uh, every Monday there will be a Jinx in-depth episode just uh, analyzing uh, Robert Durst as 
as he was depicted in the Jinx. Um, there are also already two lives that are that are that are available on the channel on the Patreon channel, where I basically talk about um, the the Chris Watts case, often responding to uh, readers' questions and the questions of patrons and so on. Some very interesting content that I've just uploaded onto Patreon that a lot of people have been sort of uh, talking about and. Uh, happy about just that it's very interesting content because it deals with the psychology is one on self-esteem and another one on ego uh, I talk a lot about um, or I refer quite a lot to what Becker has said on those two subjects I'm also daily updating a chapter in the blood and seawater audiobook and that's on the Scott Peterson case I've written a trilogy of books on uh, Scott Peterson and, and that also provides incredible insight into Chris Watts. I'm also tracking the spread of the coronavirus. I'm quite interested in um, the science of that and how it's affecting our societies. And uh, in that respect, I'm also doing an occasional coronavirus update. And I think that's on the $2 tier also on Patreon. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys again tomorrow.